All right, all right, all right. What's up, family? How are you? Welcome to Metaphysical Bible Study. I hope you're well. I hope you're well. We took last week off because of my birthday, and uh, we're back at it, back at it, going through Genesis 12, decoding, reading and decoding Genesis 12. Uh, we started all the way, Genesis 1, got some major revelations and insights as we look at this text beyond just the literal meanings, right? And um, we've gotten deep into the subconscious mind, the conscious mind, heaven, earth, animals, Noah's Ark, meditation, Noah meaning rest. And so we continue the story and the narrative and now we are um, coming across another patriarch in the Bible, uh, which is Abram who will later become Abraham and uh, Sarai, which will later become Sarah. And we'll try to uncover what the meaning of those name changes are. Uh, throughout the Bible, you'll see characters uh, change names or get upgraded, and we'll explore what that actually means. And, um, and so this particular chapter, Genesis 12, is a little bit different because it's not so much a, like a story, like we had Adam and Eve, right? Uh, we had Cain and Abel, we had uh, Noah's Ark. Um, this is not so much a story, more so the unfolding and the introduction of a major character, um, which is Abram. And so it's a little bit different to decode. Um, next week, we're gonna get into Sodom and Gomorrah, which in and of itself is essentially a story. It can stand out by itself. And we'll get into Genesis 18 and 19. We're going to skip through um, some of the, uh, we're going to skip for 13, uh, 13 through 17. Those are optional for you. There are some insights in there, but uh, I want to get back to the stories. And then I think as we get to the bigger chunk stories, it'll help us fill in the gaps that are in between. Some of them are just straight genealogy. I went through um, and actually got the Hebrew meanings of all the names of those lineages and that process alone can take some time. Um, and that's arduous work, uh, but it's necessary for if we're truly trying to seek truth. And so <clears throat> I welcome everybody here. For those of you who are first timers joining us on social media, welcome, welcome, welcome. This Bible study is different. Um, this is not a uh, passive space. For everybody who's been with us for some time, uh, we uh, are, this is not passive study. This is active study. So when you come next time, you are supposed to read the chapter and the text three times by yourself and seek to decode it in advance. Okay. So we're going beyond the old uh, religious system, which is uh, you just show up and then you get the minister's cliff note. So the minister go, goes and does all the real work, the, all the true spiritual work. Um, you get some song and dances and then uh, they deliver you their cliff notes. Uh, we're going directly to the source ourselves. I'm not the source. Uh, you go to your source, uh, whatever you call it, however you define it and however you connect with it best. Um, if you connect with it through meditation, if you connect with it through dance, if you connect through it through prayer, uh, if you connect through it with reading, poetry, writing, however you connect with your source, uh, I want you to go direct. And so uh, what you're doing is you're joining a process of truth seekers who are looking to have the truth revealed to them, not by me, okay, not by me, but through their own process of discipline study, says so study to show thyself approved. And what I'm finding in the religious space is that most people don't study. Most people have not even read the text that they claim to believe in, right, from cover to cover, right? Oh, it's just in my heart. No, you, you, you need to read it. Because I think if you'll read it, you'll find that there is a religion that is about Jesus, and then there's the religion of Jesus, and there are two who are not the same. They are not the same. Um, but if you uh, if you are passive in your spiritual growth and development, um, you will keep uh, you will keep being led uh, by wolves in sheep's clothing, and you'll keep being led astray. Uh, you must go direct. <laughs> um, I was looking at Matthew 6, 33 this week, and it says, seek ye first. Just stop right there. Seek ye first. Now we know that the word ye means you. So it says, seek you first. Knowledge of self. Seek you first. Who you truly are beyond this flesh, uh, beyond your or earthly identity beyond your name. You are not your body. You are a spiritual being having a human experience, um, but we've become very identified with the material, physical aspect of ourselves. And um, that is not who we truly are. And so that is our journey to seek ourselves first, right? 
Anybody who has convinced you that God is outside of you, that you have to go to some physical structure, that you have to go somewhere, that heaven is beyond you. Luke, Luke 17, 21, kingdom of heaven is within you. It says it right there. Yet we have all this imagery of heaven being in the sky, the pearly gates and the golden roads and angels and things of that nature. But it says it right there. Like if we just read and think critically um, about what is in front of us, the truth is there um, and the truth shall set us free. All right. And so um, today we are continuing our study of Genesis. Genesis is one of the most metaphorical, allegorical uh, books in the Bible. Um, so grateful for the writer or writers of Genesis. Um, some people say Moses wrote the first five books. Who knows? Uh, we don't know that for a fact. But whoever wrote this book has coded it um, very heavily. And uh, we are so grateful to be able to um, break down and decipher some of the codes. And this is going to be a lifelong journey. Um, you know, if you ever heard a song before, you've heard it one time and uh, you like it, and then you hear it again five years later, and all of a sudden you hear a lyric jump out of you that was been there all along, but you weren't in a space to hear it when you first heard the song or fell in love with the song. Um, that's how this process is going to be. It's going to be a cyclical or circular process. And so we will come back to Genesis eventually, right? So we will come back and keep spiraling around, but we're spiraling towards higher and higher levels of consciousness and understanding about what this book really means, why it is here, why it stood the test of time, why it is the most powerful book on the face of the earth, all right? So um, welcome, 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 everybody. Again, for those of you on social media, you can go to jointruthseekers.com, truthseekers.com to connect with us on Zoom where you'll be able to see my notes um, as well as get connected with our Facebook group where we continue the conversation uh, throughout the week as we do our individual study, all right? So uh, we are meant to go into the closet of our own minds first. And then, um, as you know, whenever two or more are gathered, uh, I am is in the midst. And so here we are gathering after we've first done our own inner work and connected with uh, source whatever you call it, however you define that for yourself, all right? So uh, with that, um, what we do here is we have a, a couple of rituals, but I never want people to get fixated on the rituals. Um, the goal is just to connect with source, to put everything that is um, uh, on your plate right now, your to-do list, just to clear your mind so that we can hear, so that we can get the divine downloads. And so um, we do a quick meditation and the meditation is it's literally just five breaths. Uh, we in heaven, right? We in heaven for four seconds, we hold for one and then we release for five. And so we're just gonna do that right now to get really grounded. Um, we know that breath is what connects us to God. Um, our breath is the one thing that we cannot control or not stop with the exception of suicide. And so what that means for me is that something must be breathing through us at all times. Something is breathing through us. And so the easiest way to connect back to your source, whatever you call it, however you define it, is to go back to your breath and just honor it and, um, and be one with it. And so uh, that's what we're gonna do right now, okay? So we're gonna in heaven for four seconds, hold for one and then release for five, ready? In heaven, hold, release. Thank you, God. In heaven for four. Hold, release. Thank you, God. In heaven, hold, release. Two more. In heaven for four, fill up your lungs. Hold, release. Last one, in heaven. Hold for one and release. Thank you, God, for breath. 
Thank you, God, for breath. You know, as long as you're still breathing, no matter what's going on in your life, God has plans for you that you're not done, that your work here is not done. And so we want to honor every single breath that we have. There are people who are dying with millions of dollars in their bank account, but no more breath, right? And so breath is the most valuable thing that we can access uh, here on this earth. And uh, that is our connection uh, to source, all right, to God. So with that um, here, uh, I was divinely inspired to uh, create this prayer. It's called the Truth Seekers Prayer. Um, if you are on uh, Instagram or social media, you may want to come over into the Zoom room so that you can actually uh, see it. Um, and uh, I'm pulling it up right now. Share. Share. And uh, this is just to anchor us in the present moment. Uh oh, so it's not working. Unable to connect. One moment, yo. One moment. It's having difficulty connecting. All right, family. Um, my tablet is not connecting to Zoom today. Let me try another method. Give me a second. Let me try another method. Try another method. Seeing my notes as we go through the scripture are is really helpful. So let me try another method um, to connect. I'm gonna use a cord instead and see if that works. All right, family, can you see my screen now? Can you see my screen, uh, my tablet, the True Secrets Prayer? Beautiful, good, thank God we had a backup. All right, so this is the True Secrets Prayer. Again, for those of you who are on social media, you wanna come over on Zoom so that you can actually see my screen and uh, I'm gonna read it to you. The True Secrets Prayer. We are true seekers. We seek the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We know that the truth shall set us free. John 8, 32. We believe that when we ask, it shall be given to us. When we seek, we shall find. When we knock, the door shall be opened unto us. Matthew 7, 7. We know that as we sit in the temple of our minds, listening for your voice and asking questions, in that holy place, we shall find understanding and answers. Luke 2, 46 through 47. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed neither hid that shall not be known. Luke uh, 12, two. We know that because the Bible is heavily coded in allegories, Galatians 4.24, similes, Luke 13.18, and parables, Matthew 13.34, many who think they are seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, including those who call themselves your disciples, Matthew 13.13. 13. We know to not rely on the letter, but the spirit of the word, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. We are meant to study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Wash our feet, which represents our understanding, so we may build our church or temple, which is our individual belief system, upon a rock of truth that we are the sons and daughters of God, Matthew 16, 16. We may, may we feel free to renew our minds, Romans 12, 2, by destroying and rebuilding our temple over and over, and get better and better, leaving no stone standing, Matthew 24, 2. We know that when we pray, we shall enter into the closet of our mind, shut the door, and pray to God which is in secret, Matthew 6, 6. And we also know that where two or more, three are gathered together in your name, I am, is in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. We pray this metaphysical Bible study blesses, builds, and brings all children of God closer to you, whether inside or outside of a religious context, even if that means wrestling with our concept of you for our blessing like Jacob, Genesis 32. We love you and thank you with all of our hearts, minds, and souls, Matthew 22, 37, Ashe, amen, and so it is. Right, so that is the Truth Seekers Prayer. And uh, um, lastly, I uh, want to walk you through the process. Lastly, I wanna walk you through the process that we use to decode 
Um, again, for those of you who are on social media, you can go uh, join us, join us at, let me type this in, www.jointruthseekers. Oops, one second. Join truthseekers.com, that's plural. And that's where you will be able to get the Zoom link and also join our Facebook group. All right, um, and just continue the conversation and follow along with the assignments that we are doing on a weekly basis uh, in preparation for our study. All right, so beautiful. <clears throat> so our way of uh, cracking Bible code, we have a uh, acronym for it. We have an acronym for it, uh, C-R-A-C-K. And um, it is first connect with God, which we did with our meditation. Um, enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy father, which is in secret, okay? Two, or the R, read. Read the text with new eyes. Release old programming, perspectives, and literal interpretations of the stories that you've known from the Bible. Uh, A, ask. Ask for under, inner, and overstanding from God. Ask and ye shall receive, seek, and ye will find. Code. Code the names, words, nouns, numbers, etc., using meditation, divine download, metaphysical Bible dictionary, and concordance, etc. And then finally, knock. Knock and the door, which is the secret, the parable, the metaphor, the allegory, shall be open. So this is our process for um, decoding uh, the Bible. And um, today we are on. Do, 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 do. Today we are on. Mm -hmm. We are on page 88 of the PDF, um, and we are, we already did the Tower of Babel, and um, now we are reading Genesis chapter 12. So we're going to go line by line and see what we can uncover uh, together. How many, uh, for those of you who are on Zoom and have been with us for uh, some weeks or even months now, how many of you read the text three times? How many of you read the text three times? Good. Remember, I, I say this and I will continue to remind you that um, if you do not do your homework in advance, then I will go ahead and just do my Bible study alone. OK, um, the reason I'm doing this is I do not want you to be a passive participant in your spiritual growth. You can outsource everything else in your life from your gardener to your dishwashing, your house cleaning, to your teeth cleaning, to your oil change. You can outsource as many things possible in your life that don't bring meaning to you. But the one thing that you should never outsource is your spiritual growth and development. That is on you. And that is how uh, religion um, has uh, trained people is to outsource their spirituality to a figurehead to lead them. And uh, you are not sheep. You are not sheep, okay? You are a child of God and you can go directly to the source, right? and get truth yourself. And so um, this is time for us to move from milk to meat. It is time for us to move from milk to meat, right? I don't care what age you are, how many time, how many years you've been going to church, it's time for us to move from milk to meat, all right? And um, that is what we are doing here, all right? So um, with that, with that, uh, we have a uh, process, oops. Where's my template? <laughs> Copy page. Um, with that, whoops. Where did it go? Paste. All right. So we uh, have a process before we start introducing, I'm going to call this introducing Abram. All right, Genesis 12. So given um, what you read uh, in one or a few words, what would you say this introduction, Genesis chapter 12 is about? If you had to name it, this is a story, parable, metaphor, allegory about what? About what? This is a story, metaphor, parable, or allegory about what? So I see faith. Transformation, oops, faith, transformation, 
good. And everybody's going to have different lenses. Ego. Ego. Self-discovery. Good, good, good. Finding self, uh, self-discovery, same thing. Trust. Trust. Good. Deception. And all right. So um, good. And so who are the persons? Who are the main characters in this particular uh, text? Who are the main characters? Of course, we have Abram. We have Sarai. We have Pharaoh. All right. We have Lord, all capital. Lot. Souls. Good. You got that one. Souls. And we have the Egyptians. And the Egyptian princes. And princes. Okay. Now, what are the places? What are the places? We have Shechem. We have Marais. We have Egypt. Canaan. Good. Hi. Bethel and Haran. Good, you're doing great. And what other things, nouns uh, or objects or things uh, came up in this story? What other nouns, things, or objects? Good stuff. Andrew's on it. We have an altar. We have, oops, we have an altar. We have famine. We have plagues. Good. We have possessions like oxen. Okay. We have substance. Good catch. Substance in the souls. Good. Good, good, good. All right. Now, what questions came up for you or what things did not make sense when you read them? What questions came up for you or what things did not make sense when you read them? Who are the souls? Who are the souls? Good. What else? Why did Pharaoh get plagued when Abram lied? We see this pattern over and over. So uh, when Moses is fleeing Egypt, because this story is recurring. So if we crack it now, it's going to be cracked in the future too. So when Moses was trying to flee Egypt, we know that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So it's not that Pharaoh said, I don't want to let these people go. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So how could Pharaoh be evil if it was God who hardened his heart? Interesting. And why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? Just interesting things that come up, right? How did Pharaoh know? How did Pharaoh know that Sarai was his Abram's wife? Good, good. After the fact, right? So you see the same story? You all, you know the plagues, the plagues in terms of Moses, right? But this same story, the same narrative keeps playing out in the Bible. We see the Jesus story happening over and over and over with J. Uh, we see it with Joseph, right? We see it with David. The same story is happening, being told to us in many different ways. So again, when we crack it one time in the Old Testament, you're going to see that we've actually cracked it several times and there's a reason repetition 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 is how you get to the subconscious mind so these same stories are told over and over and over to get to the subconscious mind right and just in different ways we even saw the story of uh jesus and noah right noah all of a sudden is building an ark jesus was a carpenter hmm right 
we made that entire connection. We did a list of about 12 different connections between the Noah story and Jesus story. Perfect in God's sight. Are you starting to see the patterns that are already emerging? We're only 12 books in. I mean, 12 chapters in. We're not even 12 books in. We're 12 chapters in. Are you starting to see the pattern? Okay. Why do, why, if Egypt is so evil, why is it so abundant? If Egypt is so evil, why is it so abundant? Why did Jesus go there? Why did Moses go there? Why did Joseph's brothers go there? When it's famine everywhere else, why do they keep going to Egypt if Egypt is so evil, right? All right, cool. So these are some good things to explore and my prayer is that we are able to get some insight and answers on uh, these as we go forward, okay? Oh yeah, why was there famine? Why was there famine in Canaan? Okay, good. All right, cool. Let's get into it line by line. All right, so uh, following, um, following the Tower of Babel, that was the last story that we decoded. Um, a lot of insight there. Um, so now chapter 12, verse one. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, what does Abram mean? Anybody look up what Abram's name mean? What does Abram mean in Hebrew? It means exalted father, okay? Their shield protection to be elevated, okay? Exalted father, their shield protection are to be elevated. Remember, all the characters and all the places and the names have meanings. Many of these, many of the characters are states of consciousness, Many of the characters and places are states of consciousness, okay? Not actually states as in physical places, but states of consciousness, right? And some of them point to specific body parts. For instance, we know that Jacob wrestled the angel or God at Peniel. Of all the names that Jacob could have named, the place where he wrestled God, he named it Peniel. And we know that we have a Peniel gland. Jesus was supposedly crucified at Golgotha, which means place of the skull, right? It just happens to mean place of the skull. Now, oh, yeah, it's called place of the skull because uh, when you die, you, people have their skull and bones. No, because we're talking about crucifying, right? We're actually talking about crucifying our old beliefs in here, in our skull. That's where the crucifixion actually happens. It happens in our skull, right? So we see this pattern over and over and over in terms of uh, in terms of body part. We think about the Red Sea. From a physical biological standpoint, where else do you know of a Red Sea, y'all? I mean, it's it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. But from a physical standpoint, where else is there a Red Sea, family? Where else is there a Red Sea? In the physical body, where is there a Red Sea? When a woman gives birth, when a woman gives birth, <laughs> y'all, y'all, are y'all catching this? If thine eye be single, thine eye be single, that's your third eye. When your physical perception is aligned with a God's eye view, that's when thine eye is single. <laughs> Right, so let's keep it moving. So now the Lord said unto Abram, which means exalted father, get, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, okay? Now, if you remember the New Testament reference, Jesus said, my father's house has many what? My father's house has many what? Rooms. Right. So when we're talking about the father's house, I believe that we're really talking about the the entire consciousness, the entire consciousness. OK. The one mind, God mind. The all knowing. OK. And so leaving the father's house. 
what this means is, Abram, break free from your earthly programming or break free from here, right? And what is fam family is usually means familiar. Break free from what is familiar or family and enter into a new level, a new land or new realm of consciousness, right? So uh, when you look at new level, Abram is the exalted father. Exalted, that's on a new level. When you exalt, you lift something up. So Abram is being commanded to actually go to a new place and a new level in consciousness. Leave what you are familiar with. Believe, leave your family, family and familiar. You notice when, um, uh, when Jesus was feeding um, the masses, they were always out away from the townships because the townships, they represent group think. Cities, they represent group think. So they were always away from group think. And group think is when you are so programmed that you don't even realize that you're not thinking as an individual. Okay? And so you're gonna see this pattern over and over and over, okay? And so moving forward, uh, moving forward, verse two, I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that cursed, curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, all right? So Abram is like this, this root, like, like being exalted as this initiation of consciousness, right? So there is the heavenly father, and then Abram is this exalted father. So Abram is, and, and we're, we're going to see this when we get into souls in just a second, okay? So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, okay? And Lot went with him. What does Lot mean? Lot means veil or covering to wrap closely or envelop. Veil or covering to wrap closely or envelop. What is the covering that you have, family? What is the covering that you have? It is your skin. And the skin is what leads to the five senses. Okay? Abram could not just go and descend, because remember, Abram is um, Abraham, is the father of um, multitudes, right? Abraham is the father of multitudes, correct? So when you have offspring, what do you call them? When you have offspring, what do you call them? You call them descendants, descendants. And so Abram is now descending down from the one mind as an offshoot of that one mind. And then you'll get into his lineage and what is that? That's descendants. It is thought descending from the higher one mind. All right. So Lot went with him because the soul, once it crosses over into this realm, it needs, it needs a veil, it needs skin, it needs something to hold it. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. So Lot went with him and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, what does Haran mean? What does Haran mean? Haran means mountainous or mountaineer, all right? So, You'll see mountains all throughout from Mount Sinai. Jesus went up to the mountain. Mountains always represent a higher level of consciousness. The Noah's Ark was on Mount Ararat, right? The mountains represent higher levels of consciousness. So here we are at Haran, which is mountainous. So Abram's coming from a mountainous place, okay? So <clears throat> is everybody with me? Are y'all with me? Abram's coming from a mountainous place. All right, so, and Abram took Sarai. What does Sarai mean? We always got to do the word study, right? Sarai means my princess, my senate, ruling body to retain liquidity. 
The body is made up of what percentage of water? Body is about 70 to 75% water. Okay. The ruling body, meaning that Sarai, being the divine feminine, represents the subconscious. She represents the subconscious. So Abram represents conscious, the conscious mind. Sarai represents the subconscious mind, the ruling body, right? The Senate, the real head. And then Lot is there, which actually creates the veil uh, of the human form. So this is really about Abram's journey or a soul's journey into the flesh. This is about a soul's journey into the flesh. And in this particular case, we're talking about Abram, okay? Yes, Mary. Um, Damian Marley had a uh, lyric said, the body is a vehicle transporting to the soul. It's what's inside the vehicle. That's beauty to behold. We keep thinking that we are these bodies. We are not these bodies. We are not these bodies. We are the spirits that are in the body. But we get so identified with the flesh due to the five senses that we forget who we truly are and where we're really from, all right? So this is the story of the descendant, the descending of a soul into the flesh, okay? And so verse five, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance, all their substance. When you have substance, substance usually means that there's no definite form because if there was a definite form, you would call it the definite form. Like Legos just spread out, that's a substance. But it's not until you piece it together that it becomes some sort of form. So substance is formless. Spirit is formless. It is the unseen. And it is the unseen which makes the seen. I don't know the exact verse in Hebrew, but it is the unseen that makes the seen, right? So Abram at this moment in time is not a physical being. And all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. This is the journey of the soul into the earthly realm. They were given souls. They went from consciousness or substance into souls. And now the next step is into body or physical form, into materiality, from spirituality to materiality. And this is the toughest journey that we all have, but it is the journey that we all chose. It is the toughest journey that we all have, but it's the journey that we all chose. And the name of the game is return back to our place of origin, to remember who and recall who we truly are, okay? So, and Lot and his brother and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, Canaan, what does Canaan mean? What does Canaan mean? We know that Canaan means land of purple, international trade or synchronicity, exchange of material goods. International trade is the exchange of material goods. So this is, the Canaan is an example of the coming into materiality, into the material experience, okay? These, these this substance, these souls coming into material experience. Now, if any of you have ever seen the chakra system, what is the color? What is the color that represents the top chakra? What is the color that represents the top chakra? It is purple. So Canaan just happens to mean land of purple and the top chakra happens to be purple. You think that's a coincidence, family? You think that's a coincidence? No. Now, when Moses um, was supposed to go to Pharaoh, right? You see down here, it says, I am. The, the root chakra is what color? The root chakra is what color? 
it's red and it represents I am. In Egypt, they had to escape through the what? In Egypt, they had to escape through the what? The Red Sea. Adam means what? Adam means what? Son of the red earth. Are you seeing the patterns and the correlations? Adam was taken from the red mud. So we are trying to elevate from our root chakra. We've descended down from Canaan, right? Which is the highest level of consciousness within ourselves. We've descended down into the root chakra, into materiality, into Egypt, into Egypt. That's what Egypt represents. It does not represent the country or the place. It represents the materiality, the material experience. And we are now elevating up back into Canaan, to the promised land the land of synchronicity where everything is working together. Nothing is missing, All right? I'm still learning the chakra system and how it works, but this is just a correlation and connection that I'm that I was able to make, all right? And I just noticed that the colors were showing up in the Bible in the same way that they showed up here. And another culture has laid it out in the chakra system, but the same things are here. And, Honestly, when uh, we go through the story of Joseph, I will show you how Joseph goes through each stage of the chakra system. Because where did Joseph start on his journey? I'll just give you a, a little hint right now. Where did Joseph start in the journey? He started in the pit. The pit is the root chakra. Joseph was given, yes, the coat of many colors. What do you think the coat of many colors means, family? What do you think the coat of many colors means? What other explanation do we have for this? thing called the coat of many colors. What other exclamation do we have for that? And Joseph started in the pit, which is the root chakra, and where did he end up? Next to Pharaoh, the crown chakra. I can't make this up, family. Joseph started in the pit and ended up at the crown chakra. All right? So moving forward, verse six. And Abram passed through the land uh, unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was there in the land. What does Shechem mean, y'all? What does Shechem mean? Anybody do their research? Shechem means shoulder. It means personal, the seat of personal interest. What comes after your head, family? What comes after the crown chakra? What's next? Your shoulders. What comes after your head? Your shoulders, they're right here. We're talking about descending. <laughs> okay? It also means the seat of personal, uh, personal interest. I didn't make up the meaning of Shechem. That meaning has been there all along. Okay, but what comes after your head besides your neck is your shoulders. Okay, so we're talking about the descending of spirit from Canaan down towards the root, right? And the root being Egypt. So this is why Abram has to go to Egypt. He's in Canaan, right? Crown chakra, purple, land of the purple, and we're descending down into Egypt, which is root represents root chakra. So I need you to remove the connection between Egypt, the place and Egypt or Mizraim, the meaning that the Hebrew gave it, okay? And I know that's hard for people to do, um, but it's something I want you to consider, right? So from here, uh, where are we? In Marae. So Marae means early rain teacher or to cast out or shoot. shoot. And I was not able to really piece together uh, what the plane of Marae means from an allegorical standpoint. So I'm still looking for insight and inspiration around Marae. Okay. So verse seven, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, right? And the parable of the sower, what does seed represent? In the parable of the sower, where seed is falling on hard rock, 
falling on the fertile soil. Seed represents what? What is the allegory for seed? What is the metaphor for seed? It's thought. We have thought seeds. We have thought seeds. Consciousness produces thought seeds. Okay? So that seed uh, um, will give, uh, will I give this land, which is a fertile land, right? And there buildeth he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Okay? So... If land equals a conscious mind, I would basically what it's saying, if land equals a conscious mind, I will expand your conscious mind so that your future seeds, which I will give you, have a place to be planted. Put your personal interests aside. Go beyond your personal interest, which is Shechem, right? So you can be taught or expanded or your territory enlarged. You want to know how the multi-family movement expanded, y'all? I put my personal interests aside. I could have built my own personal portfolio and kept the information secret. I put my personal interests aside and I decided, or I was directed to share with as many people as possible. My territory was thus enlarged. The ego is focused on personal interests. What this is saying is put your personal interests aside. Move beyond that. Move beyond that. And this is how your territory gets enlarged. Many people think that if I focus on my personal interest, that will enlarge my territory. But that is not the truth. When you put your personal interests aside and you actually move in service, that's actually what enlarges your territory. Okay? So... We're going to see altars come up all throughout Genesis, um, characters creating altars. I think that altars represent altars in our state of consciousness. They represent marks of growth. Some people, when they're growing their dreads, I had dreads in the past. When you grow your dreads and something happened in your life, you might put something there, like a shell or a clip or something like that, to help you remember. That's like an altar to remember a change in your state of being, a, a new choice, right? And to honor and celebrate something that has happened, a change that has happened in your life, okay? And so <clears throat> verse eight, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Beth El. What does Beth El mean, family? What does Beth El mean? What does Beth El mean? It means house of God. House of God. So to be to the east, if this is the house of God, if our body is a temple, this is the house of God, what is to the east? The right brain. The right brain. So when Jesus says, I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father, what does that mean? That means I'm over here in the right brain, in the creative brain, where creativity exists, where the creator is here i have my logical brain my earthly brain that is based on linear thinking here i'm in the right brain right when the disciples uh or when jesus was um uh bringing uh building this team of disciples he said cast your net to what cast your net to what which side did you tell them to cast their net to the right side family cast your thinking your net which is your neural network cast your neural network and your thinking to the right side. And that's where you will find abundance. If you only look at life with the left brain, based on logic, you will see scarcity. Cast your net to the right side and you will find abundance. This is where the creator and creativity is. This is what it means to be at the right hand of the father. Okay? So now Abram is to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. Tent typically signifies a temporary state of being. When you were pitching a tent, you don't plan on being there forever, right? So he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. Um, and there he built another altar unto the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. So high, also in other texts, Chai, 
me equals alive or living or life. We also know that um, in Eastern uh, philosophy, chi means energy, okay? So um, that's just something, a thought to hold in terms of uh, high and, and trying to explore what high means, okay? Verse nine, and Abram journeyed going on still towards the south. What are we talking about? Are we talking about ascending or descending right now? We're talking about descending. He's going towards the south, family. He's descending. And when we get to the New Testament, especially the Gospels, you're going to see Jesus going up and down, up and down. You're going to see up. I'm going to do a, I'm going to show you using um, the search here. You're going to see how often there's up and down, up and down. Everybody thinks that Jesus was always in a state of upness. No, up and down, up and down. This is, that is our spiritual journey. It is one that is going up and down. Sometimes we're in high states of spiritual consciousness and sometimes we are down. And when we've actually learned how to walk on water, it is actually that we've mastered the ups and downs and that we never drown regardless of external circumstances. Well, we can hold our high place regardless of the turmoil that is going on around us and the turmoil that is going on within us. The storms that are raging around us and the storms that are raging within us. That's when we've actually achieved spiritual mastery, when we can actually walk on water, when we've actually mastered the subconscious mind, because you know that water actually means, uh, represents the subconscious mind, land representing the conscious mind. So Jesus walking on water is a demonstration of mastery of the subconscious mind, not allowing fear, right? not allowing fear that comes up from the subconscious mind to cause you to falter. <laughs> All right. So, um, so verse 10, and there was a famine in the land and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land. Okay, so Egypt again, represents body consciousness. Egypt represents body consciousness, right? And the reason the Hebrews or Jews have uh, keep demonizing Egypt as uh, slavery is because it's really representing the bondage that we have with the body. We are limited by the body, family. We need the body to have this earthly experience, but from a cellular, from a cellular level, the body limits us. It limits what our soul is able to do. We're limited by age. We're limited by time. We're limited by the physicality of the body. We are limited. Okay. But famine, there was famine in the land. What I think that this represents is that as the soul is descending into body consciousness, this is the first time that it is ever feeling hunger. As the soul is entering into body consciousness, it's the first time it is feeling hunger. This is a new feeling for it because the soul does not need to be fed food. Right? It does not need to be fed food. And so, I think this is about the integration of the soul into the body. Famine is an famine doesn't exist from on a cellular level. It doesn't. All right, and so that's what I think this represents. And um, and they're going down into the root chakra and into Egypt uh, to be fed, which is the same thing Joseph's brothers had to do when they came to him in Egypt. They came down into Egypt, right? Now, again, in terms of Egypt, your oppressor, your oppressor will always have to demonize you if they stole from you. So the reason Egypt gets demonized is not because God thinks Egypt is bad. When these stories have been remixed or stolen from Egyptian stories, the thief of the stories has to demonize the source of the stories in their version of the story. Did y'all catch that? 
many of these stories from Horus and Jesus, and you can see the parallels, um, et cetera. Many of these stories were stolen from Egypt and then remixed into a new belief system. And so in order to make that belief system valid, they had to demonize the original source of the stories in order for them to feel justified and in integrity and as if they were the chosen, the one and only. We are all God's children. There's no one group of people that's chosen. Anybody who tells you that is a manipulator. If you're the chosen people, then who are we? We all bastards? We all foster kids? Nope, that's not my identity. I know whose I am. I know who I am and whose I am and where I'm from and what belongs to me. All right? And we're all increasing in our awareness of who we are and our birthright. Nobody stole my birthright. I may have released it for my lack of understanding. I may not have known that it was my birthright, but nobody stole it. Nobody can steal it. It's my birthright. It can't be stolen. It can be withheld. It can be hidden, but it can't be stolen. It's my birthright. And as soon as I come into the awareness of it, then I have thus reclaimed it. And I'm just going to wait for spirit to move for it to come back to me. And you have a birthright too, but while you're holding on to mine, you're missing out on yours. While you're trying to hold on to my birthright and to our birthright, you're actually missing out on yours. Yours is just as good, but for some reason you want mine. We all have a purpose here. Nobody is higher than or lower than anyone else. But these stories have been used to manipulate and to make it seem as if there's a chosen group of people here on the face of this earth. And I, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Why would God, God is the most democratic egalitarian entity, fair entity on earth, uh, on not even on earth, in this realm. Hmm. How many of you love your children differently? You love this son more than this daughter or this daughter more than this son? Yeah, that might've been your firstborn. And as the firstborn, there may become things that the firstborn gets that the lastborn doesn't. And there's things that the lastborn gets that the firstborn doesn't. But your love is pretty democratic. Even if one is getting straight A's and the other one's getting D's, your love is still democratic. You may have to love them differently in terms of how you parent, but your love is democratic. It's as equal as you can make it because you know anything that they're going through is not their fault. You created them. You created them. Now, it's not your fault either if one is showing up and the other one isn't. That's not your fault either, but you don't blame them. You try to love them into their greatness equally. In fact, when one is stepping into their greatness, right, leaving their father's house, it actually gives you more capacity to love the one who is struggling. It actually gives you more capacity to love the one that is struggling. It actually gives you, when the 99 are in alignment, it actually gives you the freedom to go get the one that is going astray. Yeah. Okay. So moving forward, uh, verse 11, and it came to pass when he was coming near to enter Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. So this is beautiful writing because fair has, is a double meaning. Fair means beautiful, right? But fair also means what? Fair also means just just. And guess what the subconscious mind is? It's just. If you plant negative seeds and water them over and over and over again, the subconscious mind does not care. It is going to grow them in the same way that it would grow if you planted good seed. The subconscious mind is just. Sarai or the divine feminine represents the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is just by law. 
You can't plant corn and get watermelon. You can't plant watermelon and get corn. It will yield according to what you've sown. Right? So, verse 12, therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. How many of you heard of the law of expectation? How many of you heard of the law of expectation? How many of you heard of confirmation bias? Confirmation bias is when you believe something and you only look for evidence of that which you believe. Even if there's a whole bunch of contradictory evidence, like you think that all men are dogs, right? You're gonna look for evidence that confirms that all men are dogs. If you think that all women are witches, you're gonna look for evidence that only confirms what you believe. Even if there's contradictory evidence out there, you won't see it. That is the law of expectation and action. And anytime you see verse 12, therefore it shall come to pass. This is a demonstration of the conscious mind, which is Abram engaging in confirmation bias or the law of expectation. He's declaring, because the conscious mind has executive power and authority over the subconscious mind, that this will come to pass. And he firmly believes it. And therefore what happens? It comes to pass. It comes to pass, okay? So it came to pass for him in a negative way, or he thought it was gonna manifest in a negative way, but we can use this same divine law in positive ways as well. So verse 13, say, I pray thee that, uh, pray thee, thou art my sister, right? That it, that it may be well with me for thy sake and my soul shall live because of thee, all right? So he wants to pretend like they are related rather than one. When the conscious mind and the subconscious mind are one, you're operating at a divine level. When they are in sync, synchronization, right? Canaan. He wants to separate. He wants to create separation, right? So that as he approaches Pharaoh, he does not get killed. Now, wait till you see this. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, right? When this soul was now descending into body consciousness, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. So when we're looking upon a woman, we're starting to talk about physicality. We're talking about physicality, right? 15, the princes of the Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, <laughs> okay? So, verse 16, and it entreated, and he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels, okay? And watch this, verse 17, and the Lord, play, and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. How many of you have ever been plagued by a thought? How many of you have ever been plagued by idea? You watch a horror movie and that thought plagued you for some time. You saw Amber Alert and what could happen to that child plagued you. You heard Fran got a diagnosis and that thought plagued you. These are not actual plagues. Pharaoh was plagued within. The body was plagued within. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why say, saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me for, to, taken her to me to wife. Now, therefore behold thy wife and take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that they had, okay? So this obviously does not make sense. Pharaoh had no clue. It was Abram who lied to Pharaoh, and now Pharaoh is the one becoming plagued by this lie, right? 
And again, we see this repetition of story of famine, Egypt, bondage, and escape with possessions in the story of Joseph. We see it in the story of Moses. We see it in the story of Jesus. And we see it in the story of Abram. This constant coming back to Egypt and to body consciousness, right? Now I need to show you something. Y'all ready for this? Watch this. I couldn't have drawn this picture any better myself. This is the story of the ego family. The great I am, there's the great I am, and then there is the I am. There's the great I am, all capital, I am that I am, and then there's the I am, and the I am is the ego. The I, capital I, space, lowercase am, that is the ego. So Pharaoh is actually operating from the ego. Many people demonize the ego, but the ego is really just a mediator between your super ego and your id. Okay. According to, um, according to Freud, uh, Freud's psychoanalytic theory, the id is the primitive in, and instinctual part of the mind that contains sexual and aggressive drives and hidden and hidden memories. What were the Egyptian princes doing, y'all? They had sexual drives towards Sarai. Correct. So they actually represent the id. The superego operates as a moral conscious, okay? What did Pharaoh, end up, Pharaoh ultimately end up doing? Pharaoh made the moral decision to give Abram Sarai back. Pharaoh is actually representative of the ego. Pharaoh could have went with the lust, right? And the sexual nature of us as human beings or could have made the moral choice, which was to give Sarai back to who she belonged to or her partner, okay? So Pharaoh actually is the ego. And when it comes to body consciousness, the body conscious, the ego actually creates separation. The ego is, this is who I am. Remember, I, lowercase am. And the separation is from the larger I am, all capitalized, I am that I am. The ego does that. And this skin, this flesh, this veil, it actually creates a false sense of separation. It is not a real separation. You heard Maze and Franklin Beverly, we are one. No matter what we do, we are one. But this, is a, this creates a false boundary and sense of separation between us that is not really real. And so Abram is at this conscious level. And Sarai is at the pre-conscious and the unconscious level representing the subconscious. And the subconscious is who you truly are. And the conscious or the ego is who you think you are. So the Egyptians and the princes were actually representing the id within us. Basic impulses, sex and aggression, seeking immediate gratification, irrational and impulsive, operate at an unconscious level. The superego, ideals and morals, striving for perfection, incorporated from parents becoming the person's conscious operates mostly at the pre-conscious level. Ego, the executive mediating, uh, me, executive mediating between id impulses and superego inhibitions, testing reality, rational, rational, operates mainly at the conscious level, but also at the pre-conscious level. So there is your heavenly body, which is your true self, right, based on the larger I am, and then there is the illusionary, illusory false self. But if you're too attached to the ego and your personal identity and your name and your body, then that you think that becomes your true self. You are not your body. You are not your body. You are the soul that inhabits the body. You are the soul that inhabits the body. And the fear that Abram had is that as the soul was coming into the body, that he would give up the I am, the larger I am, for the lesser I am. Some of us in our jobs, we give up our greater I am, our greater awareness of who we are, and to step into a lower I am. 
I'm a manager at such and such. No, you're not. That's not who you are. The larger I am that I am has no titles and no labels. The ego is attached to labels. I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm in the middle class, I'm upper class, I'm rich, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm black, I'm white, I'm Christian, I'm Muslim, I'm heterosexual, I'm homosexual, I'm uh, democratic, I'm Republican. The ego is attached to all these labels and identities. The greater I am is not. It says, I am that I am. I just am. I don't have to attach to any label or identity. I just am. And Abram's fear was that as we entered into, as a soul entered into body consciousness, it would lose its sense of greatness, right? It would no longer be exalted and it would actually be killed. Abram's fear was that the greater I am of the soul would be killed by the body consciousness of Egypt or the Pharaoh. And if you look at our human condition and experience, that is typically what happens. Every label that you have limits you. Every label that you have put on yourself limits you. Guess what? I'm not just a man. I'm also a woman. I have divine feminine and divine masculine in me. I come from my mother and father. So my mother is in me, even though I'm manifested as a man. So the moment that I label myself as a man, I literally cut off the feminine part of who I am. You as a woman, you are not just a woman, but that's what you choose to call yourself. And when you do that, you literally deny your father. No label can define you. And this was the fear. This is the allegory of Abram's fear that the larger and greater I am that was descending down into body consciousness would be killed by the little I am's of the ego. So what I need everybody to do, I need you to write down all of your labels right now in chat or on paper. I need you to write down all of the labels that you use to describe yourself that actually keep you small, that actually limit you. You think they empower you, and in fact, they kill the larger version of you, the greater I am in you that you truly are. I'm not just a real estate investor. I'm not just a black male. I'm not just a father. While I love those labels, I love those identities. I'm not so attached to them that I forget my true and greater identity. The ego, while it helps us, it also creates a false sense of separation. Unnecessary labels that only divide us. When a house is divided, it cannot stand. Abram had to leave his father's house and he was stepping into a body consciousness that had the tendency to attach to little I am's that then divide the house, split consciousness, and keep us in the material experience, living small, not having the greatest experience possible, which is just sitting in the I am that I am. So consider all your labels. You can have them, but don't attach to them. Question each one of them. Am I really that? Am I really democratic? Am I really black? This is brown to me. And if I am, 
what is actually a greater identity, a more inclusive, more godly identity than these limiting labels that I've been using? Question all of your labels. They all come from the five senses, the body consciousness, and the challenge here is how do we integrate our spiritual awareness of who we are into this physical and material reality that we call life. Hope that blessed folks. That feels good. That feels right. Not right as in the only way. I don't use right in that kind of way, but that feels, it resonates. Let me put it that way. That understanding of this story resonates with my spirit. Right? So, we're going to move forward and we're going to skip. No, you don't have to skip, but Genesis 13 through uh, 17, those are optional. I want you to get to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a standalone story that we can like cut out. Um, it's all intertwined, but that we can actually focus on. Um, based on what you learn about Lot in this chapter, it's going to come full circle when you read Genesis chapters 18 and 19. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So that is homework for next week. That is homework for next week. Read Genesis chapters eight, read and decode Genesis chapters 18 and 19 three times. Come ready, come ready to share your thoughts, your insights. Um, and uh, I will see you then. For those of you joining us on social media, go to jointruthseekers.com. Go to jointruthseekers.com. All right, and that will give you the Zoom link so that you can see my notes next week and uh, join and also join our Facebook group, all right? So everybody who's here in uh, Zoom, um, I would love for you to go to the Facebook group right now and just take a moment to capture your deepest insights from today. We captured a lot, even though this wasn't like a specific story, like with a beginning and an end, um, there was a lot here. And I would love to hear what your takeaways were from your own study and what you got from today's study, all right? I love y'all, I wish y'all the best. Have a great week. I hope you are in alignment with God and feel close, closer to God than you ever felt uh, this week. Um, make sure you make time in your day to go to source, whatever you call it, however you define it, make sure you make time to stay on your truth seeking journey. The truth is within you and you're not really seeking it, it's more so being revealed, but you have to show up, right? and ask sincerely for it to be revealed. And any truth that you receive, it should help you live a better, more abundant life, more joyful life, all right? Love y'all, I'll catch you later, peace.